Thank you, Craig. That was lovely. Good morning, everybody. How's the church doing today? Okay. I'm, I'm Sarah McCaw, Youth and Family Minister here, and uh, Pastor Jim is on vacation, but he's also at funerals, so that's too bad, but we hope he gets a little rest and relaxation. And um, so I'll be preaching for you today, so forgiveness is good. Okay. Um, <laughs> so here at, at First Presbyterian Church, we like to welcome everybody. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter um, where you are in your life. It doesn't matter who you love, what you look like, what you've done in your past. Please know that you are welcome here. We, we want to come together so that we can discuss faith, ask questions, and learn about God together. We don't have all the answers, but together we might come up with a few, so that will be great. So thank you for coming this morning. I appreciate you all being here. A couple of announcements. Um, there's a flyer in your bulletin today, and it's about September 10th. We have a big day going on that's usually rally day, which is on one side, which is the day we get ready for the kickoff of our fall programming. And we are going to be doing that, but we also have a special event sponsored by the Christian Ed Committee, Grandparents Day. So um, when I came to this church, I realized that it's a very generational church and that we have grandparents and we have kids and we have grandkids that are all connected to this church in some way. And so we want to celebrate that. And so we have a special event that will be held in the social hall. The CE Committee is bringing some yummy pastries, and then we're going to have a painting project for you. Now... Don't worry, it's not crazy painting. It's, it's very simple, and it, you're going to be making a family tree. Now, if you are in a situation where you don't have um, grandchildren to invite or grandparents to invite, we have grandparents here and grandchildren who need to be connected, so we would be glad for our church family grandparents and church family grandkids to get together and um, do some fun things, too. So it's going to be a relaxed event. We're going to do the family tree painting project. We're going to have some interview questions so you can get some conversations going and you get to eat some yummy pastries. So please come to Grandparents Day and invite, um, invite your blood relations or your adopted relations or your friends or um, get together with some of your church friends so that you can celebrate together. And then we'll have all the information that you need about the fall programming ready to go on the 10th as well. So um, just a reminder, the office is closed on Labor Day. And other than that, um, if you come to the office, you can meet our new financial secretary, Vicki. She started, and Barb has trained her well. And so come and greet her and let her know who you are. And with that, um, I invite you all to get up and greet each other in whatever way is comfortable for you. Share the peace of our Lord. You guys are a friendly, talkative bunch this morning. When you're ready to come back into worship, I will be waiting. I was reminded by one of our members we forgot to wave to our online community, so if you would just do that and welcome them. We are glad that you are with us this morning as well. So today for our call to worship, I know Pastor Jim has used this Reaching for Rainbows book uh, by Ann Weems. It's also one of my favorites. And I'm going to read from I Celebrate the Church of Jesus Christ. I celebrate the church of Jesus Christ, where two or three or thousands can gather together in the Lord's name and touch this world with the amazing good news that somebody cares, that God joins us in community so that somebody this that, so that someday this world will be loved to wholeness. I celebrate this community where the people say yes in the face of no, where they light candles in the darkest night, 
where healing and compassion leave no time for self-righteousness, and the life-sustaining love of Christ is evident in the life of the believers. Let us worship our God that brings us together in community. And you may be seated. And let us pray. Holy God, we come into your presence today with gratitude in our hearts that you have called us into your beloved community. We thank you for the beauty of creation and the hope we have that it can be restored even though we are dealing with extreme weather, fires, hurricanes, floods, rising temperatures that seek to destroy what you have called good. Help us to care for all you have given us so that each new generation can enjoy all that you have created. We thank you for this congregation of believers that seek your truth and serve this community faithfully through our work of ministry and mission. Guide us in the way of peace, justice, and love, O God, and forgive us when we lose our way and disappoint you with unkind words and selfish actions. 
We want to be your people, and yet it is so easy to follow the ways of the world, to accept lies as truth, to turn our backs on the needy, and to worship idols of our own making. Speak your words of forgiveness and grace into our hearts, and help us to trust in your love, which never fails, to gather us into your loving embrace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Jeff and Megan. I was looking forward to that all week when I saw them in the bulletin. So I would like to invite the youth and children and young, and young at heart to come forward, please. Good morning, everybody. So today in the scriptures, we're going to hear Peter tell us who he believes Jesus is. And so I have a little story. Um, we have to remember that Jesus is, we think of Jesus as the word incarnate or the word in flesh. And I have a little story about how we see Jesus differently, maybe, and, um, and what, and and how it affects us, okay? So I'm going to, just for the sake of fun, I'm gonna use Freddie and Micah as my two characters. And so Freddie and Micah, um, yeah, I'm getting the evil eye now from Freddie, but Freddie and Micah, <laughs> Freddie and Micah um, were trying to make their way to heaven, okay? And they found this big ladder to heaven, and, um, and Micah, Micah was pretty good at, you know, he's a PK, so he comes to church all the time, and you know, he's forced to go to youth group and all that kind of stuff. So. <laughs> So he was doing pretty good climbing the ladder to heaven. He, you know, came to Sunday school. He came to church. He did all kinds of church stuff, and he was getting pretty high on the, on the the ladder. Freddie had a little bit harder time keeping up to Micah, and Micah just loved to turn around and you know go neener 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 to Freddie because he wasn't quite as high on the ladder. And this competition went on for a while, but then something strange happened, and that is that uh, Jesus came and took the ladder down completely. Yeah, he just, he just zapped that ladder and it came falling down and there was no longer a competition to get to heaven because Jesus has already done whatever needs to do, be done for us. We don't believe that we have to earn our way. We believe we have God's love and forgiveness and that Jesus is part of us no matter what, no matter how hard we work or how difficult it is for us to do the things we think we should. Jesus knows that we are enough because God made us and God loves us. And that's the good news. There's no ladder, thankfully. There's no competition because we're all wonderful children in the eyes of God. And so remember that. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do things because God did create us to do good things on this earth and make the earth a better place. But it doesn't mean that we have to or that we have to do more than other people to earn that place in God's family. Let's bow for a prayer. Dear God, we thank you that you accept us as your children and that you have created us with your image in us to do things for other people to, so that they know your love and forgiveness as we know it. Thank you for sending Jesus to be with us, to come down on earth with us, to show us the depths of that love and forgiveness. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may go back to your seats. Well, good morning again. Our scripture text for this morning uh, comes from Matthew 16, 13 through 20. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. it will give you, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone 
that he was the Messiah. I've recently started listening to audio recordings of books as I commute from Dubuque to Marion. And I like to listen to national public radio, but you know, sometimes the news is a lot, so it's nice to do something different. The book that I just finished was called The Poisonwood Bible by Barbara Kingslover. A good friend of mine recommended this book years ago, and I finally experienced the novel. It is a story of a family that travels to the Congo in the early 1960s to become missionaries. The family of four girls and their mother are led on the trip by their conservative evangelical pastor father, Nathan. Nathan feels called, as he proclaims, to share the love of Jesus with the Congolese people. But the way that he approaches this task seems hardly loving at all. He spends no time trying to build relationships or learning about the people he came to serve. Instead, he condemns their way of life, not even taking time to learn customs that would be advantageous as he and his family navigate a new environment. Nathan preaches judgmental sermons and tries to convince the parents to bring their children to the river for baptism. His measure of success is the number of baptisms that he can perform. He encounters a problem, however, because the parents are wary of the river where crocodiles have been known to attack and kill children. And that makes the village people unsure of baptism or even its purpose. Nathan does not relent or reconsider his approach. He just continues to drive his hardened message to share the love of Jesus. The people of the village never came to understand who Jesus really was because Nathan's messages are contradictory and confusing, and he even succeeded in alienating his whole family. In our scripture passage today, Jesus and his disciples have traveled to Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus asked his students to tell him who people think he is, and they give four answers, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or another prophet. Jesus was like John the Baptist because he did preach about the kingdom of heaven, and even Herod thought Jesus was the reincarnation of, G of John. The Hebrew prophecy predicted that Elijah would return on God's judgment day, and Jesus could have been the resurrected Elijah. Jeremiah was a suffering prophet who challenged authorities and encountered rejection as Jesus had. And Jesus spoke with God's power as the other Hebrew prophets and told of God's action in the world also as they did. The problem though with these comparisons was that they held on to the past. They thought that Jesus must be something like what they had already experienced and encountered, but Jesus was and still is something completely new. When Jesus asks the disciples who they think he is, Peter answers for them. Peter finally gets it right. And he says that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. This is a big answer. First, Jesus, the Messiah, the promised savior of the world. The Hebrew people have been waiting for this promised king from David's line and what a time for him to appear when they were dominated by the Romans. Many were hoping for the Messiah to overthrow the conquerors. Second, Jesus is the son of God a human being that has an intimate relationship with God. Third, Jesus is the son of the living God, a God who created the world and is active in the world, a God who imparted God's image on humans. Peter's revelation is astounding, and Jesus acknowledges his answer, but also reveals that he knows Jesus did not come to that conclusion on his own. Peter's revelation about Jesus' identity was a gift from God. Peter had been given this gift because he was in relationship with Jesus. He, was, he has followed Jesus, watched him, and learned from him. It is through Peter's close personal relationship with Jesus that Jesus' identity is revealed to Peter. So who do we think Jesus is? Is Jesus the one that came to the world to choose the right people to join the exclusive club, as we hear in the media? when groups of people are condemned in the name of Christianity? Is Jesus the one who came to justify white privilege as our history of colonialism and slavery tells us? Did Jesus come to judge and condemn and frighten people into submission? Although the actions of the Christian community throughout history and even in today's world would suggest these identities for Jesus, 
This is not the Jesus who is revealed in the Gospels. As you all know, our favorite verse, John 3, 16 and 17, makes that clear when it says, For God so loved the world that he gave God's only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that, he, that the world might be saved through him. Jesus did not come to condemn, but to save the world through love, forgiveness, and acceptance. The Bible tells us about a loving, forgiving, and welcoming Savior, and we first hear it in the words of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We hear these words during Advent as we anticipate the birth of Emmanuel, or God with us. These are not titles of judgment, but titles of love, faithfulness, and peace. The stories from the Gospels tell us of the human Jesus who exemplified God's love. Jesus begins his ministry by calling very unlikely helpers, common fishermen, tax collectors, and even a traitor. In Luke 13, Jesus heals a woman who had a crippling condition for 18 years and was an outsider of her community, and Jesus heals her and restores her to that very community. In Luke 17, Jesus encounters and heals men who had been banished because of their disease, even though such encounters are forget forbidden. In John 4, we hear about Jesus teaching a Samaritan woman with a questionable reputation, an outsider on three counts, but worthy of a relationship with Jesus. In John 8, Jesus rescues and forgives a woman who was about to be stoned for committing adultery. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus welcomes the children, although they had just been sent away by the disciples because they considered them to be unimportant. In Luke 19, Jesus befriends Zacchaeus, a hated tax collector and a colluder who worked for the Romans. While on the cross and in pain and agony, Jesus forgives his executors and comforts the other criminals hanging on the cross near him. Jesus reaches out with love, acceptance, and forgiveness to the people that have been shunned, excluded, and persecuted. Jesus did come to save the world, as the Messiah was prophesied to do, but he did it with God's love and forgiveness, not with judgment and fear. We learn in Colossians 1, 15 and 16 that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers of powers, all things have been created through him and for him. Jesus is the Son of God, intimately connected and empowered by God. He gave us a physical image of God and God's love. We relate to God in a new way because Jesus lived among us. Jesus is the son of the living God. He is active in the world, always creating life in new ways. Because we are created in God's image, because Christ lives in us, and because Jesus came to bring God to us, we can be the people God created us to be and share God's love with others. As the followers of Jesus, we have a purpose and a calling. Jesus came to bring us together into the beloved community of God so that all could share in God's gift of love, acceptance, and forgiveness. We are one community made to love God and our neighbors. We are not an exclusive club, but an inclusive family, a single community of God's beloved children brought together by Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. I would like to end my time with you today by reading a children's book. I think children's books tell important messages in accessible and profound ways. And our story for today is from the book, In God's Name, by Sandy Eisenberg Sasso. It's illustrated by Phoebe Stone and published by Jewish Lights, and the pictures will be up on the screen. After God created the world, all living things on earth were given a name the plants and the trees, the animals and the fish, and each person, young and old, had a special name. But no one knew the name for God. So each person searched for God's name. 
The farmer, whose skin was dark like the rich brown earth from which all things grew, called God source of life. The girl whose skin was as golden as the sun that turned night into day called God creator of light. The man who tended sheep in the valley called God shepherd. The tired soldier who fought too many wars called God maker of peace. The artist who carved figures from the earth's hard stone called God my rock. Sometimes the people who called God by different names were puzzled. They said, every little thing has a single name, the marigold, pansy, and lily, the oak tree, sequoia, and pine. God must have a single name that is greater and more wonderful than all the other names. Each person thought his name for God was the greatest. Each person thought her name for God was the very best. The farmer who called God source of life said, this is the true name for God. The girl who called creator of life insisted, this is the most splendid name for God. The shepherd, soldier, and artist believed that each had the perfect name for God, but no one listened, least of all God, and so each person kept searching for God's name. The slave who was freed from bondage called God Redeemer. The grandfather whose hair was white with the years called God Ancient One. The grandmother who was bent with age and sorrow called God Comforter. The young woman who nursed her newborn son called God Mother. And the young man who held the hand of his baby daughter called God Father. And the little child who was lonely called God Friend. All the people called God by different names. They tried to tell one another that their name was the best, the only name for God, and that all other names were wrong, but no one listened, least of all God. And so each person kept searching for God's name. Then one day, the person who called God Ancient One and the one who called God Friend and the one who called God Mother and the one who called God Father, all the people who called God by a different name finally came together, and they knelt by a lake that was clear and quiet like a mirror, God's mirror. Then each person who had a name for God looked at the others who had a different name. They looked into God's mirror and saw their own faces and the faces of all the others. And they called out their names for God, source of life, creator of light, shepherd, maker of peace, my rock, healer, redeemer, Ancient one, comforter, mother, father, friend, all at the same time. At that moment, the people knew that all the names for God were good, and no name was better than another. Then all at once their voices came together, and they called God One. Everybody listened, most of all, God. Let us pray. Dear God, please help us to see Jesus as your Messiah, your Son, the living God, in the world you created and in each other, so that we may become the beloved community that you intend. Amen. We'll now sing our hymn. You may stay seated for this. Craig, we're singing in Christ there is no east or west right now. <laughs>
And now let us share this time of prayer, opening our hearts and our minds to God's grace and God's love, remembering those concerns that each of you carry in your own heart as we go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, through long generations, you have called your people to a life of faith that honors all that you have created. Through your word, you have taught us that broken relationships can be restored when we acknowledge our part in the damage we have caused and ask to be forgiven. We, however, have been unwilling to restore our relationships, and the brokenness in our world is evidence that we have fallen short of your desire for health and wholeness. The Messiah you promised came into this world in the person of Jesus Christ to save your people and restore our relationships with you and one another. Jesus' ministry and mission was to show us the way of love and acceptance for all people and nations. Jesus created a beloved community where all are welcomed, all are valued, and all are loved unconditionally. We are mindful this day of those who are experiencing the devastation from fire and flood and wind that has caused the loss of lives and property in so many places. Comfort those whose lives have been forever changed and whose grief is overwhelming. We pray for those who have generously provided supplies to help meet survivors' most basic needs. We pray for those who search for life in the midst of so much death and destruction, and for families who are waiting for word about their loved ones. Holy God, even as we pray for strangers, we are mindful of those in our midst who need your comfort and care. We pray for those who are grieving and any who are recovering from illnesses or injury, Help the homeless and the hungry find access to food and shelter. Be with those who are lost and alone. Uphold those who are struggling with depression or addictions. Help us as your people to reach out in kindness and love to this hurting world that you love so much. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who taught disciples when they pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now will you please join me in our affirmation of faith. We are saying what we believe. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick, and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Our morning offering is our opportunity to return to God what God has already given to us. We do that not just financially through our pledges and gifts, but we also do it by sharing our lives, our talents, our time in this world that has so much need, we are called to address that need. If you are able to give a financial commitment this morning, there are 
offering baskets at the front and at the back of the sanctuary, or you can mail your donation to the church or stop in and drop it off, or there is a giving button on our website where you can give your gift electronically. We certainly appreciate all your gifts, not only financially, but time and talents, and also your prayers and your giving of love in so many ways. Let us offer our prayer of dedication. Knowing that many voices compete for our attention, we pray that these offerings given in love may become symbolic of our decision to follow Jesus and serve the Lord of our salvation. Amen. You may.
God has called us through Jesus Christ to be one in community, serving and loving our neighbor as we, sh as we strive to love the God who creates, sustains, and redeems. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may we be encouraged to be God's people as we go out into the world.